What have you been through to get here? What battles have you fought to hold your spot? How did you become this person you are? See, some never pass the obstacles of their past, tripped up by hurdles of pain, pressure, and loss. Why did you succeed? The truth is you're fighting for more than yourself. You're battling for those who haven't made that next step and can't realize it's right in front of them. Because when you're alone, it's harder to see your own greatness. Sometimes it takes someone to remind you that you can conquer anything, that no goal is impossible. See, addiction affects so many people. And if your story can help get someone through, can inspire others, well, that's success. Nice to be back, but as Dwayne Casey always says, home won't take care of you, you gotta take care of home. I love coming here. This is, uh, besides, you know, my childhood, this is my second home. And uh, you know, my dad spent three good years here, and we have a lot of good memories. Um, living down on Lakeshore and playing, uh, you know, all across the, the, the province, uh, you know, when I was here. So just a lot of, a lot of great memories and, and definitely feels great to come back. You know, knowing my wife still has a lot of family here and get to see them and, and enjoy the memories of, of the Air Canada Center too. I never thought, obviously, that, uh, you know, he played the NBA, much less be that, that this good. But it all kind of started right here. You know, this is uh, he, he, when I played in Toronto my last few years. He, um, it's kind of where he was an age to really f see what was happening and then, you know, figure out what was going on. And then from just to, to have that work ethic and that desire to, to want to play at this level, then um, you see the success he's having. It's a father's dream come true. Um, and I never get tired of talking about it. I remember him being a great kid. 12 or 13, you know, he wasn't an average 12 or 13 year old, you know, he really had his head on right, and uh, he would be out here before the game shooting, and you know, just like you see people around right now, you know, it would um, he would be out there shooting, like right before the game when all the fellas go in and knocking down NBA threes and having the crowd wow at that age, and I think this has kind of been his playground, you know, for uh, since he was a kid. My son Andy was always, like, every chance I, I got to bring him up here, he was always hanging around Steph was always around, so my kind of me my memory of Steph kind of includes my own son always shooting around before games and you know those guys you couldn't get them off the floor that, that was the funny part you'd have all these NBA players that are getting ready for the game and there these kids are on the floor shooting and Steph was just bang bang it's just very natural very fluid you could see right away that there was a uh, there was you know that something that you just can't put your finger on it and, and I always think to be a great player you got to have imagination and if you watch stuff by himself, he's always doing like there, he's playing. He's, he's got this game going on in his head. That to me said, you know, this kid's got something. I think all great players have a love affair with the sport. That they just love being in the gym. They love bouncing the ball. They love shooting the ball. They love being around the game. They love being around players and coaches and refs and the energy in the building. Uh, so he had that. He grew up in a very uh, competitive, uh, driven, disciplined house, and uh, yet with people that were very, very grounded and, and great parents and a great family. So uh, just, I couldn't be happy for him because, uh, you know, knowing Dell and having got to you know the, the boys a little bit when they were little, uh, it's just nice to see. It's, it's, it's a really cool story. Here mentioning the NBA uh, MVP, talk it's uh, kind of surreal you know, my wife and I are still pinching each other saying hey it's, this is our son that uh, you know a little Steph that grew up but uh, grown man now with a wife and a family and uh, he's made me a granddad so life's good Golden State comes away with a 113-89 victory tonight and Steph Curry tonight with 22 points
born and raised in Goshen, New York, uh, about an hour north of the city. Uh, I said my dad was a coach, so basketball was introduced to me at an early age. Uh, but a, a big part of my uh, basketball success belongs to uh, an inner city near where I grew up called Newburgh, New York, um, which sadly has the highest crime rate in all of New York. It has the highest murder rate uh, in all of New York, one of the top ten in the country. Um, but that's where I knew the best basketball was, and I, you know, uh, had a, met a couple friends that brought me in there um, into the inner city to play, and, and that's really where I learned so much about basketball and so much about life, uh, you know, the inequities in, in society that a lot of people don't see. Um, it's a big reason why I adopted inner city children. Um, it's a big reason why I've, you know, dedicated my life to helping young people and to children, and it's where I get the most fulfillment uh, and the most enjoyment. And I, I owe a lot to Newburgh, and uh, that's where all the best players were. And uh, you know, my a big part of my heart will always be there. I still go back. I've still got good friends. We have a nonprofit organization, Hoops Express Incorporated, that. You know, we do what we can, uh, you know, to help as many of the kids, you know, get out of there. So I played for my dad at John S. Burke Catholic High School in Goshen, New York, um, and shot at any time I wanted to. No. <laughs> But no, my dad was tough on me, and he was tougher on me than the other kids, which I think was a good thing. It, it helped me in my development. I went from there to UMass, University of Massachusetts in Amherst on a scholarship. I played there two years. Uh, the coach that recruited me got fired, and I ended up transferring to Sacred Heart University in Bridgeport, Connecticut uh, for the next three years. I sat out a year. I uh, was lucky enough to become a Division II All-American. Um, tried out with the Knicks. Uh, did not make the team and decided to, to my path was going to be coaching. On the baseline, Amundsen spinning past Amir Johnson. Wow, look at that move there from Lou Amundsen. The Raptors have got to try and claw out of this one. Valanciunas leading in on Amundsen, spinning towards the baseline, and he buries the one-hander. JV right back at you. I had worked the five-star camp which was also a huge uh, tool in my development as a young coach. We had just phenomenal coaches, Calipari, Patino, Hubie Brown. I mean, the list goes on and on. Mike Fratello, Chuck Daly. Um, it was a who's who of great players, but also great coaches that back then they could work the camps. PJ saw me working and coaching there, Carlesimo, so I, I, he offered me a job as a graduate assistant at Seton Hall. I spent a year there with him, then I was offered the same position at the University of Kansas with Larry Brown, which John Calipari had a big hand in. I went out to work the Kansas camp in the summer because John coached there. Uh, then I became a full-time assistant coach at Charleston Southern University, a, a lower division one school in Charleston, South Carolina. And then John Calipari got the head coaching job at UMass, so uh, it was kind of a reunion. And I knew UMass was a sleeping giant. You know, he had called me during his interview and said, what do you think? I said, take it. You know, we can build something special there. And we went from one of the 10 worst programs in the country to number one in the country for a good part of our last three or four years there. Had some great players, Marcus Camby, Lou Rowe. Uh, had a lot of success. And then I was uh, fortunate enough to become the head coach at UNLV. Uh, coached there for the better part of six years. And uh, we had some good success there. It was a learning experience. I was 32. Um, you know, we ended up winning four conference championships, two regular season and two tournament. We the, went to the NCAAs twice. Um, and then from there, I went to uh, coach a little bit in the ABA, which was kind of a floundering league. Uh, we didn't have any money, and I went overseas, coached in the Philippines, coached in Puerto Rico, came back, coached in the CBA with the Yakima Sun Kings. Uh, and then uh, got a chance through Kevin Pritchard to get in the NBA and Nate McMillan with the Portland Trailblazers. I think each coach, uh, you learn something different from. Everybody's different. And I, I think the one thing I learned early on is that you have to be yourself. So you take bits and pieces, and I think all good coaches have done that. You know, uh, you, you, you know, I took certain things from Larry, certain things from Coach Cal. The year I was at Kansas, Greg Popovich spent the year with us there and pop and i were close and i 
had a lot of conversations with Pop as a young young guy, picking his brain about life, in, in you know, and basketball. Um, so you know, you pick and choose different things. You try to mold that around your personality. You know, obviously, communication is huge. You know, being able to communicate with your players, being able to gain their trust. Uh, and it's something you have to earn, you know, by working hard, by letting them know you care about them, uh, by putting them first, um, you know, the, the work ethic, you know, and then there's all the different X's and O's. Every coach has a different style. Uh, you know, obviously I was with John for the longest time, Calipari at UMass, and, uh, you know, just the heat, that's where I got my basis for coaching. with the ball dribbling on the right side into the left corner wide open Gravis Vasquez rattles down a triple from the east side and there you have it Leo called it Spence coming down Main Street kicks it up to Galloway the triple up and it rattles down that's a killer an absolute killer for the Toronto Raptors as it puts New York up five and that's going to do it the Raptors are 4.5 seconds away from seeing their losing streak go to a season high five it's amazing how quickly chemistry can disappear when you're struggling the Raptors are not on the same page right now they have spurts but not that consistent effort together that we've seen we all know we we out of rhythm we, we all know that uh, we're not we're not playing Toronto Raptors basketball and uh, we, we are concerned and um, and it's, it's a collective thing, you know, it's not just the players and the coaches, it's, it's all of us. It's, it's time for us to, to be a man and, and face the situation, you know. This is when you find out who is with who. So I think we got a pretty solid and together team, so now we got to show what we're made of. We acting that we, we, we ain't going to the playoff. We acting like the end of like tomorrow is the end of the world. I mean, why, why are we acting like that? And it's all of us. I put my first myself first on the list. Well, we second in the East is still we second or third. That's you know that's proper. That's pretty good. We we beat some good teams, five teams up from the West, and then they were good to, good wins for us. So we we proven that we can do it. So it's up to us. You know, we we can we can't feel sorry for ourselves. We can point fingers. We can't do anything else but come out on Monday and be pissed off about it and trying to get a win somehow, some way, whether it's by one. I don't care. We, we need this win on Monday. Seven-all run right now for the Sixers. DeRozan, little fade away, pull up at the free throw line, knocks that down. Under four to go here in this first quarter. DeRozan's feeling it right now. Bingo. Sampson now kicks it back out. Noel decides to end for it home. Jonas a spin. Gets it back out. And DeRozan back out to Patterson. Good ball movement this time. Patterson knocks it down. Sixes shooting exceptionally well tonight. 54%. And they got 28 points in a paint. So and Lou Williams doing the work. Man is one of the masters at drawing fouls. Well, I think like all alcoholics, I knew at a young age. Uh, I think I, I knew something was wrong with me probably the first time I ever had a drink. Um, I can't remember how old I was. I was young. I snuck into my uh, grandparents. A refrigerator. I was probably 11 years old, 12 years old, and wanted to see what a beer tasted like. And I ended up drinking three or four and passing out. And I can remember then waking up, even as a young kid there, uh, you know, like there's something's not right with this. But I think, you know, when you are, when you have the gene and, you know, you, you have that issue, the minute you put alcohol in your body, you're in trouble uh, because that, that triggers the addiction. As a head coach, that's where I really used it as a crutch. As a player, it definitely affected, you know, I was able to become an All-American, but I, I really think I could have played in the NBA if I wasn't battling that. And, 
you know, I can remember playing most of my games hungover, you know, and, and, and drinking so much the night before. And uh, uh, another great story, ironically, I'm the head coach at LMU, and the Inglewood High School coach, who I knew, Pat Roy, who coached Paul Pierce, asked me to come speak at his sports banquet. And so I, I said, yeah, sure, I came to speak, and there was an older gentleman there that came up to me and said, hey, you don't remember me, but I was the assistant coach on Mario Ellie's team at American International College. We played you in the NCAA Division II uh, Final Eight to go to the Final Four. And we, he said, I remember you the night before the game. You were at the hotel bar. And I was there, and all our boosters were buying you drinks, trying to get you drunk. And you kept accepting the drinks. I said, yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday. And I said, in my mind, I was going to get drunk and prove to you that it didn't matter and we could beat you. And, you know, so, it, but at the time, you know, when, if you're an alcoholic, you have a tolerance. So I didn't go crazy that night. I probably had 10 drinks. If that doesn't sound crazy. <laughs> that was a mild night for me. And I'm looking over there cheering them. Yeah, okay, I'm still going to whoop your butt tomorrow. And as it turned out, we did. We beat them. And I was, you know, the MVP of the game. I made eight free throws down the stretch. Uh, we went on to lose to Manute Bowl uh, the next game. But what no one knows is the night before the Bridgeport game as well, I lost control and I drank because I thought I was invincible and I was a, an alcoholic. And we ended up losing to Manute Bowl to go to the Final Four. And, uh, and a, a big part of it, I take the blame for it. I was hung over. You know, I always throw the day out, December 23rd, 1999. I was coaching at UNLV. We were having a, a pretty good year. A, a, a big game was coming up against Eddie Sutton in Oklahoma State, and I really thought we had a chance to win it. And we lost a heartbreaker. And I had made a pledge to myself that I wasn't going to drink all season. And we had a three-day break. And I went Christmas shopping with a friend of mine. And we went out to lunch. And he made the suggestion, let's have a drink at lunch. And I had one drink, and the next thing I remember, it was 5 o'clock in the morning, and I was just getting home. I don't even remember how I got home. Uh, and I kind of broke down. I called my mother, and I just started crying and said, I have a problem. I can't control this, and uh, I need help. And so I, I basically, you know, quit drinking from that point on, and I had about uh, a year and a half sober. No coincidence, the next, that next year, we won the Mountain West Conference regular season and tournament championship. We won 23 games. Um, but because of a, a big part of my issue at UNLV with me being fired was my off-season lifestyle. You know, I didn't drink, rarely drank during the season, but college is a 12-month-a-year 12, 12 job. And uh, so that caught up to me. I ended up getting fired, and uh, I went on a little four-month uh, runner lost control again and was actually coaching in the Philippines and that's when I decided to get professional help and I got a psychologist and we started you know working together and and, and that was the the turning point where I just knew that something bad was gonna happen and, and alcohol and drugs had put me in so many bad positions I was very lucky uh, you know that something terrible didn't happen to me you know, when you don't have control and you're, you have that issue, you know, you're, you put yourself in tough spots. You know, the lesson to be learned is since then, nothing but good things have happened for me. And, uh, you know, I've had a lot of players that were in my position. I think I've helped some of them. Uh, but again, you know, ultimately it falls on the individual. You, you know, they, you, there's only so much you can do trying to help. But I do think my experiences have helped a lot of my players that have had similar issues and, and when you've gone through it you can talk to them and the minute you you talk about your own experiences if they do have an issue you connect because they hear they see you in the stories that you tell and so they know you're not bsing them and and uh and so i'm, I'm always willing to try to help anybody uh, i tell my story uh, i'm not afraid to tell it i'm lucky to be alive uh, you know i put myself in some really really tough situations that you know, I had an angel or God or whoever it is looking over me, protecting me, and, and, and hopefully it's because I have a purpose in this life uh, to help young people. And so I try to give back as much as I can, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a story worth telling.
James Johnson backing down with Amute. Turnover here, steal from the Sixers. Cannon has it blocked by Johnson. Big block there, the Sixers still have it. They still can't make it go though. James Johnson, a little block party is saying, no, 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 get that garbage out of here. I learned this from Larry Brown at a young age. If you're coaching and you're doing it with a pure heart, you're always going to be learning. You know, no one has all the answers. You know, every every system has its merits. You know, so being able to work for Nate, who has a different system than Rick Adelman, who has a different system than Coach Casey. Uh, you know, learning from all the other assistants that I've worked with. You know, that's the beauty of basketball: is that you're constantly evolving, you're constantly growing. Uh, if you love the game, you know, and the game will love you back. And that's something that I try to preach to all our players that, you know, if you love the game and you respect the game, the game's going to love you back. You're going to make a lot of money. You're going to have a great life. I have an unbelievable life from the game of basketball. I am so blessed to do what I'm doing, to do something that I love to do. Uh, it, to me, it's not work, you know, and it is tiring and it is an unbelievable grind, but it's still at the end of the day, it's, it's not work to me. It's, it's doing something you love to do. Uh, you know, you, it's hard. The biggest difference in the NBA is that no matter how good you are, you're going to lose games. Great teams are going to lose 25 games, you know, 30 games. Uh, so dealing with the losing is something that you have to to handle in the NBA because you're going to lose and you got to get past one game and get on to the next. You got to constantly, you know, try to keep your players up and keep them positive and and keep them believing. And you know, because like Masai said it in our retreat, you know, as good as we are, we're going to go through a stretch where we're going to lose five, six, seven games in a row. You know, that's where you got to stay together. That's where you got to grind it out. You got to stay positive. You got to keep your guys believing. Um, you know, and, and you can't separate and you can't let your guys separate. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I think that's what makes us special here is that, you know, nobody's pointing fingers, everybody's together, and, and we're going to figure this out and we're going to finish the year strong. There have been moments tonight the Raptors look like that team from December were moving the basketball, and then there have been times when they've been getting stuck. The Williams long three. <laughs> Same action is a back cut. And the slam from DeMar DeRozan. Season high, 31 for DeMar with some emphasis. I love it. Again, they love that little mid-post action. They won all four quarters. They won all four games against Philadelphia this season. That's eight in a row against the Sixers. And the bleeding has stopped. Five-game losing streak is over.